Hello, Hi. Debbie. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Hello. John. Hello. I'm, I've known Anthony. I'm Debbie Chuma. Um, I grew up in Montauk. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I've known Anthony a long time, and he was a good friend of my father, uh, Bob, Captain Bob Tuma, on the dawn. Um, and they know each other from the docks for a really long time. My father didn't do commercial fishing, he did charter fishing, but the charter fishermen and the commercial fishermen, obviously, as this book uh, gets into, is how the whole community is really interconnected. Even though they have their fights of which one they like better and which one they don't like, and they spar back and forth. But Montauk, as you know, the book points out, is all interconnected with all kinds of interesting people. And uh, one one thing I I wanted to say was, you know, when I heard about the whole incident, it was so riveting to me and their survival story. And I heard them speak at Guild Hall about a year ago at the Dance Papers Literary Festival, and it was just so moving to hear their whole talk. So. But so I read the book, and um, obviously I uh, was impressed with their survival story and what they went through, and the book was excellently written. But what also hit me when I was reading it on an emotional level was, holy crow, like, uh, what went into the, how the whole town got involved from the citizens to the Coast Guard to the all kinds of fishermen to the little boats to the big boats to... This thing, I don't think he would be here today if it, it was all an interrelation of, of human beings on every level, especially their relationship, the two of them, which I didn't really know their background, which I'll talk a little bit about today, how as growing up as friends since childhood, working together on the Anna Mary, their fishing boat, and being partners for so many years in the business, um, really, really coming from a passion, this is the other thing, a passion for fishing and a passion for what they do, following their heart, doing this for a living for years and years and years. And I know myself personally the risks that people take when they go fishing. <coughs> and as you probably have heard, it's probably number one, I think it's number one rated in the National Book of Occupations of, of Risky Jobs. Uh, fishing, as you see in Alaska and crabbing and all that, and plus out here in, in the ocean. And Montauk has the, um, Montauk is the biggest port uh, in New York State, bringing in the most <coughs> dollars to the economy and the most fish to all the, the markets. So um, it is a big story, and it is a big story for out here. Um, and I experienced, I just want to lastly say that I had a father who went out every morning, and we never knew if he'd really come back at night sometimes, especially in thunderstorms and in, in hurricanes. And even in hurricanes, my, in the old days, back in like the 60s and the 70s, the fishermen would have to literally um, go and sit on their boat in the hurricane, and he would put on his foul weather gear and go sit on the boat with his mate with ropes through in a hurricane. That's what they had to do, or else they'd lose their boat. So. We know what it feels like to lose somebody, you know, or to have a problem. And um, so when I was reading this, I was like, wow, it is so risky. And this can happen to anybody. And it's, it's just um, also exciting that you like it so much that you just take that risk and you do it. And that's what life's about. You just do what you want to do. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to, so let's start out with basically John Aldrith and Anthony <coughs> Szynski start out quickly, we'll just get into without, you know, the whole thing, but let's start out with what happened to you, Johnny, on uh, your story, which started, what happened to you on the day of July 24th, 2013? Well, it was the day I made the biggest mistake in my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, Anthony and I have been friends since, you know, second grade. Um, we, we own the boat together, and we've been fishing for 20 years together, 30 years, um, you know, recreationally and then eventually professionally. Um, so, you know, for us, it, it, it ended up being, being complacency for me, you know, uh, being on a boat, being used to fishing, being used to what goes on on our boat that day is the reason why, you know, <coughs> complacency kills. Um, um, so for us, you know, it was a routine trip. Uh, we were leaving at 8 o'clock at night. Uh, we have this refrigeration system on the boat because where we fish in the canyon out there, it's, it's hot water on the surface. And um, so our tanks are refrigerated. And this particular trip was our first trip with this new refrigeration system that we have. 
And uh, since I'm the guy that usually does the tinkering on the boat and messing around with stuff, I figured let me get it going, let me get it running, so that when I'm not on watch, um, they don't have any worries. They could just go and you know, not have any worries about the system working. So um, on that particular evening, Anthony and our other crew member Mike was asleep. I was on watch. It's about a 10 hour ride out to our fishing grounds and uh, we rotate through the night. Um, I was getting the uh, tanks ready and the, the ready for the next morning and as I was moving, these two coolers were on top of each other. And as I was pulling them off with this like three foot long hook, um, <coughs> they were full of ice so I was using all my might and I was pulling on it, I had a plastic handle and the handle snaps. And within, you know, half a second, I'm falling out the back of the boat because our boat has an open transom on the back. So the traps get slide off the back of the boat into the water. Um, and <clears throat> there I am, now I'm in the ocean. And you can't even believe you're in a situation where, you know, you know you're so screwed up. You're so screwed, you can't even, there's nothing you can do. And there goes the boat away in the distance and, and it's, you know, leaving you. You see the lights, you see the back of the boat. And what time was that? I'm estimating about 2.30 in the morning. Um, so you're in the dark in the morning. So now I'm in the dark in the water. And uh, it's funny because a couple trips after I went back fishing, I threw a piece of cardboard over to see how, how long it takes from when it fell in the water till I couldn't see it anymore. And it was 17 seconds. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> I, that's fast. So when I saw the boat going away from me, I mean, everything in your head's going through your head. You can't even believe you're put in a situation. You know today's the day you're going to die. And then you've got to live through that fact of realizing that today's the day you're going to die. No matter what, in all instances, nobody falls in the water in the middle of the night that no one's seen that's ever lived kind of a thing. And you know that as a fisherman, you know, how bad a situation you're really in. So that mentally is going through my head. Now I'm panicking and I'm kicking and I'm screaming and I'm just about to drown because I exerted so much energy and so much panic at that moment that I was going under and um, I realized that my boots were very buoyant and these boots I use are you know, big heavy fishing boots and um, I kicked them off and I grabbed both of them on my arms like this. And, and I got an extra breath, and I was like, wow, all right. I could, like, lay on hold and told me up, and something, within a second, something clicked in me. I said, empty the water out and just create an air pocket, and I put one under each arm, and, and I'm out, now I'm out of the water this high. And I'm like, okay, I'm not dying right now. Like, right now, I'm not dying. So that, like, kind of empowered me a little bit, and I said, all right, all right, you know, I know how bad the situation it is, but... I'm not sinking at the sec this second. So it gave me some time to think, gave me some time to assess the situation for whatever I could. Um, and I just <coughs> basically was in my head um, for a long time, trying to figure out you know, where I'm at, what I'm doing, how am I gonna survive this? I'm in the ocean, there's all kinds of life. Now immediately hitting the water, I had these storm petrels, these little black birds dive bombing me, really? pecking at me and coming right down at my head, like really close. I couldn't believe how, like the second I hit the water, they were on me. And um, so I'm dealing with that. I'm trying to float. You're trying to think what's going on. You see the light and then all of a sudden that's gone. Now it's completely black. Yeah. And uh, just a little bit of a moon and, um, and uh, about a four foot swell. So I come up on the swell, I come down on the swell, the water's going up my nose and my mouth, I'm trying not to drink any of the water. Um, and I just start saying, all right, I know I fell in the water about 40 miles from land. I knew where I was approximately. I knew that it was 2 o'clock in the morning and, you know, sunrise is going to be coming up in the east. I knew the direction of the waves from the night before. I knew which way was southwest and I knew, all right, that's going to be east. And I just focus on sitting, looking to the east, waiting for that first bright dip of sunrise to come up. And uh, that was all I did was just keep focusing on the east, kept focusing on the horizon. The sun's going to come up, 
they're going to wake up. And hopefully, they're going to find me. And I didn't get that far in my head. I just kept saying, uh, I just broke it down very small, very small. I kept setting goals for myself, small goals that I would accomplish and then get to. So once I established that part of it, I said, I just got to stay alive to daylight. I just got to stay alive to daylight. And I just kept saying that to myself over and over and over. And as I kept saying that and getting in that head, two sharks swim by. Oh. And literally, they're like from here to that post. And I'm sitting here with my boots, and I whipped out my little three inch pocket knife. <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking like this, and I got my legs up tight, and I'm freaking out. And I, you, know, you don't know what to do. And I'm like, oh my God, there's sharks right there. And you can't even believe you're in a situation. And then I said to myself, I go, I got to calm down. I can't be freaking out. Um, you know, I got to calm down my heart rate, my breathing. And I just had to focus on that and not even look at them. And they're just swimming back and forth. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to watch my legs and spin around slowly and watch and see the water, see if there's anything, you know, if they come near me. And I just kept saying to myself, you know, calm your heart rate, you know, slow your breathing down. Because, you know, the predator with the hurt fish kind of a thing. They'll just come right and bump you and check you. So then eventually I got out of some kind of empowerment and I said, uh, I, I was so you know, into those sharks that I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And I just said, you know what? If they come after me, they come after me. And I'm gonna fight them if they come after me and then I'll deal with that at the next thing. So I couldn't even focus on them anymore. I just had to stop, just leave them over there. They're doing their thing. If they come near me, I'm felt in my, I could, I could beat them up. I just felt like, I'll just kick that shot, you know. And that's empowerment I had for myself. So, and then, you know, um, I went through the day. The day the sunrise came, um, immediately I heard, I guess about an hour after the sunrise, um, I heard a helicopter thump way, 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 way off in the distance. And that was like another pick me up, because then I knew he was awake. And he had called the Coast Guard and they were looking for me because in the ocean at night or anytime you're in the ocean, if you're not on a boat or you're not near the land, the water don't make no noise. So it is super, super silent. It's definitely, it's so silent, it's crazy. You hear the, the blood in your ear, you know, in your, in your veins going, it's so silent. Um, and all of a sudden I hear a noise. It's like, what? And that was like, boom, empowered me to be more strong and feel like hope. And then they passed me through the day and everybody else, nobody seen me and it was like up and down. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I figured I had to find a buoy. I figured I had to find a buoy. Uh, knowing where I was in the ocean, I knew I was amongst other lobster gear. Um, and I figured my salvation would be find a, something to hold on to, something to grab onto. How can I live in the ocean on my boots? How can you float? How do you? How do you live like that? You know, so I figured, let me get to a buoy, and eventually I had gotten to one. Um, and when I had gotten to it, I realized it probably wasn't the best move because um, that's connected to the ocean floor. There's a swell. Now, every time a wave goes by and the, o and the ocean's moving, it's sucking me under the water, and now I'm coming back up again, and you know, and it's sucking me back under the water again, and I'm coming back up again, and I'm like, it's better just me floating on my boots. Oh my um, so after you know an hour or so or two of that, <coughs> I said, I got to cut that off. I cut the buoy off and I started swimming in the direction of where I saw the helicopter. Don't tell the whole forth. book. Don't tell you the know. whole book. People have to read it. <laughs> but, uh, That's the breathing area. Yeah. I mean, we'll come back to that a little bit yeah. in a minute. But I wanted to get the drama of what happened when you actually fell in. Yeah. And then I wanted to ask Anthony, uh, just take it, you know, don't tell the whole book, but it's pretty riveting, I'm sure, when you woke up. I mean, that had to be like a pivotal, scary moment. So I just want to ask you, what happened, what happened when you woke up and what was your feeling? Well, thank, thank you everybody for coming. All right, so we'll start with that. But my first initial was, we have another crew member, and his name is Mike, and Mike wakes me up to tell me Johnny's not on the boat. So very first, I'm in total disbelief that that's not accurate, but you're from like asleep, but not asleep. Mm -hmm. And then it's, um, he's not here. So at that minute, I'm completely in shock and can't believe. And our boat 
is not all that big. I mean, it's 45 foot long, but there's not many places to look. And when I first walked out on deck, we have like these big tanks below deck. Each one can hold approximately 2,000 pounds of live product. One is wide open, water's bubbling out of it, and I'm like, I look inside, I stuck my head in there and looked inside, figured maybe he fell in and drowned, and um, he's not in there. So, you know, immediately, probably within the, under a minute from when he, when I was awake, I realized he's not there. And um, the first, very first thing I did is I turned the boat back north. I wrote down my coordinates to where I was, because knowing where I left, and I phoned the Coast Guard and uh, you know, said, look, I, I'm missing a crew member. Uh, and I started realizing how far offshore I am right now. I'm 62 miles from land. And the last time I saw him, we were eight miles from land. So there's you know, more than 50 miles of ocean between when I saw him last. And you know, that's one of the reasons why our book is A Speck in the Sea, is he really was a speck in the sea. I mean, straight up. I mean, he's less than a grain of sand in your hand. Um, but I, you know, over the, the, I never sweat before like that in my life. I, my feet were sweating. And I've been through some things very similar, but not on the same boat that I was on. And, you know, I heard Joe Hodnick screaming for help um, when his boat sunk. First boat on the scene. It brought me right back to that. You know, as a little boy coming to Montauk, the wind blown was a big deal for our town. I, you know, that, that was pumping through my head. And, you know, I know Johnny's family. I know his brother and sister and mother I ate out of their refrigerator. He's, you know, Better you know, I was like blown away. Tell, tell them where you're from. You're from well, we're both from Oakdale. And, um, you know, when I was a little boy, my, my uncle Sammy had worked in Montauk in the 50s with my father on the Viking. And they brought me to Montauk as a little boy. And then on the weekends, I would be a weekend warrior in Montauk. And um, I just never left here, you know. So Johnny and I had been coming here since little kids, tagging along with my dad, working on the Viking. So Montauk has been our second home, even when I was a little boy, even though we didn't have a house here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to, you know, I was, I was blown away. But then within the first couple of minutes, it was like, almost like game on here is, you know, where is he? Because I know he fell overboard. I know he came with us. Well, where is he exactly? So as my minutes was ticking by, I was really just trying to analyze our boat. Because John and I had rebuilt that boat together. We know every aspect of it. But it's a mystery on where he went. You know, and the Coast Guard's asking me questions like, did he leave a note? <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, did he leave a note? <laughs> You know, I'll be back. You, know, you know, they're like, is he a good swimmer? I, I'm like, well, he can surf, I, you know, he's just, he, and he's very resourceful. Not realizing he's got his boots under his arms, you know. But then over probably within 25 minutes, I had found the handle of the cooler. And I started putting this whole scenario together. And I, under a half hour's time, I told the Coast Guard how he fell over. Mm -hmm. I visualized everything except I didn't know he used a hook. I thought he grabbed it by his hand. And I had found this handle of the cooler right by the back of the boat. It was probably maybe four feet, three feet from going off the back. And I walked up to the cooler, and I lined it up to it, and it fit exactly perfect. And I pulled it away. And even though the cooler was clean, you could see it was a fresh break. And I then went back in the wheelhouse and I started thinking about the day before on how we had the refrigeration man and how we started chilling this water down. And I put a scenario and I'm like, okay, we were going here. Two hours before would put us to here. 
And I'm like, this is where it fell over. Only problem is, is that water's moving. The ocean is not stable. It's moving. So there's this current moving. So we have someone like Frank Braddock, who's shark fishing in 32 fathoms of water. He's telling me the currents move in one direction. The Coast Guards put buoys in the water. The currents move in the other direction. But during this whole time, I got our, within, within a few minutes, I got our Montauk fishing fleet calling me on the radio. And, you know, there's, you know, Mike Scarimbus, Vinnie Dam. I, I mean, I can go through the names. They're like, where are you? Where are you? And one after the other is coming. And as we were like, each boat was coming, I would figure out what the, where they were, and I would just move them another, either on the east side of our fleet or the west side of our fleet. And with, you know, throughout the day, we had 20 plus boats, you know, from different states. I mean, three it's. Three states, it's in about three states. I mean, you, you think you're alone out in the ocean, and then you have like the Armada show up for you. But during this whole time, you know, and I don't know any of this, the Coast Guard and everybody is going by what I'm telling them. And the Coast Guard is not allowing the civilians to help them. So we wound up going onto our own channel, and I had my civilian fleet <coughs> on, one, on, on one channel, talking to the Coast Guard on another channel, and talking to the helicopter on another channel. But I only have one radio that's working. So I got every, and I keep getting calls. Hey, they're calling you on 16. They're calling you on 22. But, uh, you know, so my day was, I was like in the command post of my boat where he was in the command post of the ocean. So we both were trying for the same outcome, but we were in a totally different element. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. I understand that. Wow, so you got all those people together, um, the Coast Guard, and, and you were all, it was, in the book you talk a lot about these chapters about how they find someone, the Coast Guard gets this all the time, having to find people who see not quite as dramatic maybe as this. And uh, they do it by coordinates, all the things that go into it, the size of the person, um, the weight, yeah, they gave me 19 the fitness hours. level, they gave hours, me 19, 19 hours. 19 hours of survival with the uh, water temperature and my, water temperature. my height and weight. Yeah, it was amazing when you read the book, you're going to find out with all these rescues, which, which is stuff we should know living out here, what goes into this, and I never really knew all this stuff that I read, like all this, it was very complicated, and it was <laughs> yeah. a big, big effort, but that's a lot to have happen in uh, only 12 hours, you, stay, you were in the ocean 12 yeah. hours, right? Uh, that's a lot of enough. stuff to happen, and all the while you're probably thinking in the back of your mind, we have to work quickly, because how long can he stay alive? That must have been like really excruciating. Well, by the time they stress. started looking for me, I was already in the water four hours. Wow! Wow! So then they started. So I had to live for four hours, knowing nobody in the world knows I'm even missing. Yeah. 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 You know, so that was a whole thing. Yeah. You know, trying to get through that in your head. It's like I, nobody I, in the world knows you're even in this trouble. You're. You feel. You feel completely helpless, and I'm sure he felt the same way. Like you're really small here. And you're trying to like will the person back, you know. And I can only explain it like if you have an animal, your dog runs out of the house and it runs down the road, and you're like, "All right, get, gotta get the car keys." But we, you know, you call in the dog. Well, you're not looking for a dead dog. You're looking for your dog. Right. So that's what had always stayed in my head was I'm looking for a live John Aldridge. I'm not looking for a dead human being. So. You know, throughout the day, I'm thinking how he's being tortured, how he's suffering. I'm, I'm not thinking he's dead. Because once you think the person's dead, you're not looking for a dead body. You're looking for a live person. And every time I would talk to the Coast Guard, <coughs> I would always attempt to give them something that I felt was positive to continue to have them look because I was begging them. So I had begged them at first, I need a plane and I need a helicopter to fly due south of Montauk. I knew that we would never get a boat there fast enough, but I knew a plane or a helicopter would. And even in our town, we had people in our town that own aircraft and they were at ditch planes waiting to go surfing in the morning and heard this. And they went to our local airport, got in their private plane, and went out to go look for Johnny. 
Wow. You know, so it's like our little town with all our little resources, everybody put their heads together. Right. And, we, you know, it, it's an amazing place. That, and anybody that has lived here for any length of time knows if someone has cancer in the town, we will do what we need to do for that person. And that's how I felt that day. And it's humbling, and I um, am very proud of Montauk to be the town that I live in, for sure, and honestly. I, also, I agree with that. I also have to say that your relationship and the closeness that you two, the working partners, the friendship, knowing somebody all those years, knowing almost their every move, second guessing where they might be, you know, that kind of, I think that contributed to it as well. And um, so we can't give away the whole book because obviously we want people to, um, to buy it. Whoops. And so we don't have to maybe, obviously you know he made it. <laughs> just one little question I, I wanted to ask you from reading the book is, uh, so it's such an experience to be in and everybody's sitting on the edge of their, their seats when you're telling it because it could happen to anybody at any time, you know, even recreational boaters, people on a cruise, whatever. Uh, so what is it, John, that do you, tr do you attribute most to keeping yourself alive through all this? I guess it would be probably my inner strength, you know, in my, uh, just having to get back inside yourself and come to grips with what's going, what, you know, what was actually going on and and being able to, uh, to, f to keep all of that stuff in check, you know, the, the panic, the, 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 the negativity, the, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that really was the key to surviving. And also, I was, you know, you said in the book how you thought about your loved ones and you, you, yeah. you, you wanted to stay alive to see them again. That's, that, a, big, that really that's a very strong me. reason yeah. to survive also. Yeah. How would they feel if they never saw you again? What if you never saw your nephew? Well, that was a, that was a twofold thing because it was like in the beginning I was like, you know, thinking about my family and my relatives and people I love and everything. And then you start thinking... You know, what if I don't make, and then you, you're like, I can't even think, think about, about them right. anymore. You know, I, I got to think about just living right now. I can't think about that because that's like a negative. That's like, oh, you know, they feel bad for me. I'm going to maybe not live. I, so I had to just block that away after realizing that that could almost pull me down too. Okay, and after you were, okay, when you were finally found, and we won't say how or what happened, all the details are in the book, um, what, I don't know this, um, what happened, I wasn't even around that time, I think, um, what happened when you were found in terms of the celebration, like, when you came back and they found you, what was that like? Well, I was, did you in, guys, I was in the hospital do? overnight, and oh. up in uh, Falmouth, Cape Cod up there, and, uh, you know, my sister and my a brother-in-law and they came pick me up and brought me home and we went to my parents house in Oakdale and we come they live in like a down in a cul-de-sac and we come to the top of the hill and we look down there was 30 news trucks down at the end of the hill <laughs> I'm like stop 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 I don't want to go I don't want to go you know and, uh, I gotta go see your mother <laughs> so what condition were you in? I forgot to say. I was, uh, you know, I had second degree sunburn on my face, and my face was bright, bright red and brown, and, uh, you know, dehydrated. My core temperature was 94 degrees. Um, and dehydrated? I had very dehydrated. Um, Hungry. My tongue was swollen, my lips were swollen, all of that. And uh, eventually, you know, through the night, that subsided. subsided but. Uh, did yeah. you have a big party in Montauk? We had the big beach party in Montauk. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. We didn't get invited everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Michaels. Uh, we had Chief Michaels. We yeah. had all the law enforcement showed up too. <laughs> like really? <laughs> Chief Michaels let us go by. Sorry. <laughs> oh my God. And Nancy Atlas wrote a song for them. Yes. And yes. that's in the book also. And she sang it at Guild Hall when they when they when they too bad she's not here singing it. Yeah, that'd be nice. What's the name yeah. of it? Johnny Load or uh, Tale of Johnny Load. And tell them your nickname. I don't know if everybody knows. My nickname's Johnny Load. It's from when I was a carpenter back in the day. Uh, you know, it was one of the guys that I was hanging out with was a. Uh, a real woman, get a real, you know, chick magnet. <laughs> so I called him Kenny Load. I kept calling him Kenny Load, and it just bounced back onto me. And uh, not that I was a chick magnet, but uh, he, uh, you 
you know, just how nicknames stick sometimes. And lastly, I just want to obviously now tell us just two things. Uh, how did you come? How did you come about writing the book, and and how did that happen? And then after that, <coughs> tell us about the movie that's in progress. Well, the the book um, at at first after Paul Tuff from he lives in Montauk had wrote an article for the New York Times Magazine, which became the story of the new year, 2014. And then um, we wound up signing a movie contract with Weinstein Production. Wow. And, um, which we're not with Weinstein anymore, we're with Blumhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was a close one. He, <laughs> he got in trouble. Me too, bro. He, <laughs> He got in trouble in April, and I mean, he got in trouble in May, and we um, got rid of Weinstein in April. So we were one month before the Me Too movement um, had started. All uh, right, but um, we wound up holding the rights to the book, um, and only sold him the article that was in the New York Times magazine. So um, over um, a two and a half year period, um, Johnny's sister Kathy. Um, Myself, Johnny, um, we uh, hired a ghostwriter and uh, started working on writing the book. And it took about this many manuscripts. Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> months and months. But we, I guess it was like 14 months, yeah. give or take. Back and um, forth, back and forth. And we uh, put it together. And uh, <coughs> so that's how the yeah we the figured book came you know about. it's a good the, title. The too. article gave you know. <laughs> It was a very good article um, in the New York Times, but it, it didn't it didn't express how much the community was involved. It didn't express, you know, the detail of our lives and everything. So we figured we had to write that and and put everything in one, you know, paid book. So where does the movie stand now, and it, when is it going to come out, and you know, so who's going to be in it? We spent the summer here with a screenwriter. They had sent the screenwriter out and. Uh, you know, the, he's back in Australia uh, writing the movie as we speak. Um, and, um, you know, as soon as they are satisfied with the screenplay, they'll start shopping it out to directors. And uh, it seems to take forever. I mean, yeah. he's, you know, I mean, it's just crazy how long yeah. it's been. And now that we're not with Harvey anymore, now we're with Jason. It's Did just, you meet Harvey at all? Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Did you really? Did you see any stories? I was on the couch. <laughs> Hey, he's blonde. He's got long hair. Hashtag me too. But uh, yeah, you know, bigger than life, crazy. It was an experience. Um, wow. Yeah, it was a very large you stuffed animal. Have... A teddy bear's office. Yeah. Oh, I found out Schwartz one. Like uh, honestly, it was like six foot tall. He had pictures of like Gandhi and. He had all these uh, uh, Oscars, right? He had these Oscars. I picked two up. I'm like, are we going to win these or what? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just I tell you, like, um, it's funny because fishermen, they get discovered all over the place. I had a friend who was a fisherman out here, just a fisherman on a boat. He got discovered by Zoli Agency and became a major model in Manhattan. He's out modeling and he, he had his picture. Well, he was in all kinds of ads, but it was hysterical. We're an adult audience, so I could say this. He had his picture on a condom ad. Everybody in Montauk was just laughing their heads off. He couldn't even go in any restaurants. Is that That was John McKernan. Everybody knows him. He's a great guy. Oh, and then uh, Tommy Fleming. Tom Fleming. We, Tommy have, we haven't got those also. endorsements yet. He, he got discovered and he became a model. So all you have to do is become a fisherman. And you get like, everybody thinks it's the most romantic life. And, you know... Not that it is, you know, but yeah. you can see this. It story. is a plan on the hey. ocean. Well, <laughs> Ocean's a little bit. So you become the heroes. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Russell? It is one question was very early on was what month are we talking about and what was the ocean temperature? It was July and it was 71 degrees the water. Uh -huh. okay. Yes. Yes. It's nice. <laughs> you guys are awesome and inspirational and you really are super. But I need to know, at any point, did either of you cry? Uh, I didn't cry when I was in the ocean, no. no. I was screaming a lot. I was talking to myself a lot. <laughs> I would pick up John's driver's license, and I would holler at him. And I would use the F-bomb a lot. <laughs> Where are you? 
And then I would throw it back on the dashboard in disgust and stand back up on the rail again and look. Because it couldn't answer yep. me. The question I have is that the presence of mind that you had with your uh, uh, boots, do you think of that like immediately? Usually boots fill up with water. The process of elimination. You had no. tremendous presence of mind. You, you yeah. thought about that right away? Right away. Did I was like, um, yeah. well, because when I was just about to drown, I was noticing that my boots were floating they were tight. up. They were tight. No, they weren't that tight. They weren't tight. No, and they were very buoyant. So they were floating up like this. And I was like, and I'm on my back, you know, right. back pedaling, going, what the? So I just pulled my feet out and right. just grabbed them, you know? And then just my brain started working really quick. That was the boots right These are the actual they boots, yeah. Show them, hold them up. Yeah, these yeah. are the actual boots. Yeah. They look, they See, look they, 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 they say Dunlap here. What but, is that? But they say Dunlap right here, but what? Dunlap won't give me an endorsement, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so they're out. You should have gotten a free pair of boots. I got one free pair of boots. Yeah, really. <laughs> They'll be coming after after a while. Yeah, let's we'll see. Just, just was wondering, um, you went back, obviously, to work. How long did it take you to go back and what precautions now did you want? Okay, so I, I took two trips off and I went back fishing. Oh my God! Um, I wanted, to, in, you know, July. It was, it was in the heat of our season. We we're killing it, and you know, so I wanted to go right back, but I had to stay home two trips to How make my mother happy. How could you even think about? I could never imagine going back uh, after Debbie, that experience. Uh, Debbie, I went right out. Yeah. I can't I, believe it. When I came home, he went to go deliver lobsters and bring bait for me, so I can go back again and make money. Yeah, we were just oh, on that boat. We were in that zone. <laughs> You guys but uh, we've put a tailgate on the back of the boat now, so it's not an open <laughs> okay. which is key. Uh, you can't really have a harness on the boat because you know there's tons of rope all over the place and a lot of stuff to hang up on. And on a sailboat you can, but not on a on a boat with a lot of stuff like that. You know, honestly though, in July, uh, you know, not many people have a life jacket on in the middle of July. But you just don't. You should. You know, I mean, it's just, it's the nature it's of the beast. It's like you're walking water. around in shorts that day. But would you wear, are you wearing one now or not? Uh, I wear my boots. The water's too cold and I can't live anyway, so. Oh, they always say there are no atheists in a boat that is sinking. I definitely said, oh my God, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you, did you, I mean, be religious or not, did you all of a sudden develop a sense of faith? Um, well, I would like, I was, uh, you do in a certain sense. I mean, I, I you know, I was I born mean, Catholic. Personal, I would, you I'm know, I, about your own personal spirituality. A yeah. little bit, yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, you know, you, you get in your head and you pray to whoever can listen and, you know, uh -huh. the past relatives and anybody out there. I mean, you're really by yourself when you're in the middle of the ocean at night, you know, really by yourself. So. My mother was at church and had a special mass being said at St. John's Church in Bohemia. And when she came out, he was found. Wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so, sir, in the back. Now that you have faced death, yeah. face death. you have faced death, yeah. which probably no one in this room has ever faced. This man has faced death. How has it changed your life? Well, I got a movie deal and a book deal out of it. <laughs> um, you know, you, you don't take it for granted. I don't take any days for granted. I don't take any moment, any incident, anything. You know, I don't be complacent. I, you know, think through things now. I don't. I think we all. I don't need sweat. To know that. I don't sweat the small stuff. You know. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy. I was involved with the NYPD SC rescue, and uh, while you were in the water, I know, and I guess these people should know, the word spec is uh, uh, really an exaggeration. You're, you're nothing. <laughs> to see somebody even from two miles, one mile, a dot, a dot in the water, you, it's, it's so hard it's to see somebody in the yeah. water unless they have some kind of bright thing or, or so I'm guessing you were wearing normal clothes. I had, you know, brown hair, blue shirt, in the ocean. So the, not the best color. The, the, when you heard the helicopters, and I've been in situations where we were looking for people and and, they, and afterwards you talk to them, I know at one, at one point the helicopter came in and it went away. Yeah. It came in and went away. At any point did you go, 
I'm done. You see, I turn. I, so that feeling you're talking about, I had that earlier on in the day, and I realized how powerful thinking negative is, and how seductive it is to die. And it just just give up. It's easy. Just mm -hmm. take a couple of breaths. Mm -hmm. It'll all be over. Mm -hmm. And that scared me. And I was like, wow, I can't even think about that. So anytime I saw the helicopter, I saw him pass me twice, I saw another lobster boat pass me, I saw the other boats pass me, I had to just turn it around and say, at least they're still looking for me. Keep fighting. Because if I turn it the other way, it was like, woe is me, I'm gonna die, blah, 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 no power left in me, and you just wallow. And I was like, no way am I going out like that. And that's what empowered me to keep going. I just had to have that train of thought. You realize you're on such an edge that if you think that way, you're going to die. I can't think that way. So you think this way. And that's amazing, really. Yeah. Everybody should know that. Just another question to follow up with. Oh, yeah. Just to follow up with David, I, I don't know. I always wondered how hard is it to ride a unicycle? <laughs> Well, since we played hockey together, I, I got the unicycle the same day I got my hockey stick. How was I on skates? <laughs> Wild man. Uh, Evelyn, if you were given any input, who could you see playing you in the movie? Oh. <laughs> Should we tell you who we were told? Or? Yeah. Is it somebody we know? Uh, yeah, you know, well, we're talking Jake Gyllenhaal and um, oh, okay. Casey Affleck. Wow. Okay, I was thinking of you, Ben Affleck, but he's, he's getting too old. Too old. <laughs> I mean, probably my age, but yeah. Yeah. they yeah. want to yeah. cast it a little younger. Oh, yeah. How, when, you you, when you fell in the water, you were 45? 45, yeah. Oh, okay. 50. 45. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hurry up and get that movie out. <laughs> uh, go ahead, yeah. Do you find it stressful to talk about it? No. It probably okay. helps, you know. Yeah. I've been, I, every day since I've come out of the water, in some sense, I've talked about it. Literally, every single day it comes up in some conversation and something and everything. I think of it out on the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I'll see I a mean, wave I, and I'll be like, ooh, I remember that wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, it does take a certain person to have your strength and your will to live out there. And, and certainly, you can speak to that. Have, you, have the Coast Guard or anyone approached you about doing inspirational talks to Coast Guard men or... I've been speaking all over the country um, at different events. Uh, I've spoken in Mexico, California, Seattle. I think keynote speakers and certain things um, with that. Yeah, you I, know, mean, um, I would think that that's something that's uh, in you Alaska, can share that, and that must feel. The survival training people in Alaska had wanted me to buddy up with them, kind of a thing. But that's like you know, yeah. if I was retired, maybe. Right. But I, I, you know, I got I'm still active fishing. You know, I can't yeah. can't do all that kind of stuff yet. Right. Well, I just thought of something. You could look at it like people do say this. Like maybe that's. I know it sounds silly, but maybe that's part of the reason on a spiritual level that you have this experience, so you could share it and like help other people. Yeah. Well, so I've gotten emails from people, which is incredible. I've gotten an email from a lady who was in an avalanche in a, in, a, in Washington, mm -hmm. and she was on the mountain with four people, and two of them had gotten killed and they had to stay with them through the night and they couldn't get rescued till the next day or two. And she had read my article in the New York Times and all through the night she kept thinking of how I thought and empowered myself and stayed alive and I had no hope and I made it through and, and, and afterwards she was saved and everything and she felt compelled to write me this <coughs> big email. Now that's incredible. And uh, I was like blown away by it. Oh and she my like God. attested her survival to my story and, and it was inspired you by what happened that to me. That's incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. That's incredible. Do you want to know what the shirt that he had on, what it said? <laughs> no, God. <laughs> 2013 Montauk Blessing of the Fleet. Oh. Wow. Yeah, Probably so. the only article of clothing that he owned that, that got blessed. was just blessed <laughs> by the priest. <laughs> <laughs> he fell over in July and he got that shirt blessed in June. Yeah. Uh, right? and, and, and what about and all the deceased captains? So when yeah. you see him in the um, helicopter, when he's getting out of the helicopter, you look that says Blessing of the Fleet, oh Montauk, on his shirt. That's wild. Oh so there's your spiritual like movie. I needed every bit of help. Yeah. Really? Wow. It would have been better than a life jacket. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That would have been the best. Not the knee part. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, just one other question. On the sharks, when they were rammed and so forth, was that the only incident of that? Uh, no, everything in the ocean came to family that day. So uh, the sunfish. Tell them about. So that. I had so I had the sharks at night, and then early in the morning I had uh, porpoises swimming around. I hear them, you know, breathing like probably a little further away from you. They were going by, checking me out. Know, what is that? Um, and then as I'm swimming from one boat <coughs> to the next, in total, you know, mode, knowing you're on the surface, swimming like a frog, knowing a shark could come right up and grab you, and trying to block all of that out. A fin about this tall comes up right next to me, right here, oh and I'm like, "Oh!" You know, and I freak <laughs> out, and you, right away, of course, you think it's a shark, and it's a, about a 500-pound uh, sunfish, ocean sunfish, oh which is, you know, half the size of the screen. Wow. And uh, he just kept, he stayed right on me, like right here, and you know, big eye, and you're looking at him, and he's just, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't uh, you, they don't that care. mouth is like that big, but, you know, oh, yeah. you know uh, and so I just I kick him, <laughs> and he takes off like a Volkswagen through the water. <laughs> um, and then throughout the day, I'm literally becoming an ecosystem. I mean, I got this sea lice, I got oh. this shrimps living on me, my clothes oh, yeah. are starting to... Like, you know, get create life basically. Right. And when I was in the hospital, and they rolled me over. You know, rolled me out from one bed to the next. All of these little critters were falling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like little shrimps. Uh, we were gonna uh, see how much uh, uh, they can get for. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, so that, you know, Cup the soup. <laughs> the agony just kept coming. You know? Oh God. Quite a book, uh, quite an interesting. Oh, so I hope people buy the book. There's copies available in the back, right, Denise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. Okay. And, and, and Debbie, I just have to thank you for, for moderating and for thank all you, you do to support the library and the Montauk community and the entire East End. And guys, Johnny and Anthony, thanks for taking the time to tell your story. Mm -hmm. But I want you to make a promise that when you do win that Oscar, that you'll come back oh, and yeah. 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 in the display case for right. a little. Oh, right, okay, right there. I want to take a picture of you with the library. Okay? No problem. Okay. Thank you for having me.